Uh, hi, I'm Musal from CG Consultancy, and I'll be talking about uh, one of the implementations that we've done with Apache Ignite. It's basically on a hotel search system that had been around for a while, and um, it's, uh, well, kind of was at the end of its tethers when it comes to sort of expanding and scaling up. So we got in for this project, and we kind of did some due diligence, looked at options, and kind of picked Apache Ignite as a baseline for building a new system. So I'll just go be going over the architecture and some challenges that we faced uh, while building it. A little bit about me, I've got a bit of a background in sort of like distributed and in-memory systems, like mainly in the financial industry, and um, uh, just building stuff in-house to start with, slowly like progressing to using third-party products as they matured, and um, finally jumping into a fully well managed system where we just like take the whole baseline from a third party and build just a business logic on top. And this is what this project was. Um, after the initial bit, I, um, I started working with CG consult Consultancy where we looked at these sort of migration product projects. And this is the main one that I worked on. Uh, the project was for Jack Travel. Okay. Yeah, so just a, a bit of overview of hotel search systems. It's a little bit like a typical retail system with a search bit uh, like at the, at the front. So you, if, it's just like if you go on any um, holiday search, uh, you just go on Expedia or something, you search for a room um, based on what you want in whichever location you want, and then um, based on some sort of price or rating and it returns your result, prices it up for you. So, yep. Um, yeah, so basically you start off by you specify uh, the location and room, and um, yeah, you get, uh, yeah, it, it gets the prices for you, it gets the room, um, matches up the room location, and then it uh, prices the room, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the operations uh, that we do, it's, it's, it's most of it's um, right now in databases, so it's all data driven, and uh, it's typically I/O bound more than CPU bound. So anything that's disk based is what's taking up the time, and um, uh, like you start getting rid of that, but um, you try replacing replacing that with uh, uh, in memory systems. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's basically the search journey. Um, yeah, so uh, the hotel room selection basically is the first bit. Um, let's see, yeah, excuse me a little. Yeah, so uh, a typical search journey, um, you start off by specifying where, you, where the hotel, um, whichever room you want. The yeah, the location and the contracts basically, uh, sorry, excuse me, I can't read that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, as, as, as you start off your searches, um, you look for a, a location you want to search in. So the system basically picks out the location and uh, finds out what contracts your system has available for that location. And then, uh, basically, processes any sort of like distribution rules that you have Say, for example, um, you're, as a, uh, you're a travel agent and you're allowed to search for certain uh, locations via this uh, company, then what the system will do is it will um, find all the relevant um, third parties that you could search for or relevant um, hotels that you could search, and it will filter, that, filter out everything else. So after that, it will basically uh, look at your room search criteria. And from there, you'll pick out um, any relevant rooms, exclude any rooms that don't fit your criteria, and then basically you'll look at the availability for those rooms for the dates you specified. Um, so uh, after that, uh, you, you look at any other further restrictions. For example, if you have any other restrictions on that date, if it's like a uh, event day, there might be restrictions on like, um, a minimum number of days you have to stay and such um, 
uh, criteria, and it'll filter things out even further. After that, it's basically just a uh, retail cost and pricing system. It will look at um, the prices that are available, any supplements you need, you need to add for that. For example, if you have any, um, uh, if you like, have internet add-ons or any um, uh, meals uh, or breakfast, half board, etc., it will add all of that and provide options based on that. And that will get your base cost for the whole, um, uh, well, uh, for, for uh, your company. And then it will add um, anything else you have to actually form a price that you want to sell at, like the margins and the tax, etc. Once you've got all of that, um, comes a little bit of, uh, you got a, a set of duplicate prices um, or, or duplicate rooms based on how many suppliers you have for those hotels. And you might have different options and different offers from, for those rooms. So it needs to do some deduplication and sort them and um, uh, well, get rid of any, any uh, rooms that are basically don't meet your pricing criteria. Once you've got a unique set of rooms with the prices that uh, you want, you build a response and you reply. That's, that's basically what a hotel search system does. Um, I'll be going over a little bit about the architecture, say what the old system used to look like and what the new system looks like. Uh, yeah, so at Jack Travel, they had two platforms as a result of a merger where um, both systems did the same thing in slightly different ways. So the um, out of the two, the one they decided to keep was called iVector. It's, um, uh, it's, it's by a company called Intuitive. And the other one uh, is Travel Studio, uh, which is um, being migrated out, basically. The system is built on SQL Server um, with a thin uh, .NET VB layer running in IIS. Um, it's, all the business logic is done in installed procedures and um, it's as close to the data as possible, which is uh, good in some ways, bad in others. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's been it, working fine, but it's difficult to scale out uh, once they reached the stage they're in. Um, any, any other expansion was just getting diminishing returns while the costs were going up. Um, that was at about 100 SQL servers plus a whole bunch of IIS boxes and it was uh, handling about 140 million searches a day uh, with an average uh, response time of two and a half seconds uh, with the 99th percentile uh, sometimes timing out which uh, were at a limit of 30 seconds, um, which wasn't good enough, of course. Um, they, they've tried a lot of things. Uh, first thing they did was upgrade all their hardware. So they got to the uh, faster CPUs available to them at that moment by the supplier and uh, re uh, replacing all the drives with SSDs. Uh, they've, then they've tried some software options, optimizing everything as much as possible, uh, building search specific tables, um, and uh, uh, then moving some of those tables in memory as well, which brought about its own challenges, like in SQL Server, if you move tables in memory, you have further restrictions and indexes and whatnot. Um, and that, that yielded some results, but it was still just basically staving off the inevitable for weeks rather than anything else. Um, yeah, so um, we looked at other options, uh, different products uh, that we could do. Um, there, like Microsoft have uh, online, well, uh, a, a more in memory options in Azure. We tried that but didn't spend too much time on it because they'd actually gone the in memory uh, table route for a bit. Um, Ignite was basically a whole new approach. Uh, the challenges were it will be completely new development um, using skill sets they, they did not have. So um, that's where we went in. We brought in our own people and then set up a whole project. Um, uh, and with that a project basically entailed designing a whole new system, getting Gridgain to do a POC, 
and um, then uh, using that POC as a basis to look at what our options are for a real production system. Um, yeah, so um, the overall design after some research we ended up with, it, it basically looks like this. You got a number of cash nodes fronted by um, Jetty, so they would be handling a lot of all the HT requests as HTTP requests, and um, then you will have all the actual compute jobs as well in there. All the uh, nodes are hold all caches as fully replicated caches, so there's no partitioning going on. Um, the main reason for that was um, what you don't want doing a search is data going co coming into a node and then going back over the network onto a different node. Um, uh, yeah, so that saves any extra network latency. Um, we started off with the caches on heap back in Apache Ignite version 1.6. That's because back then off heap caches were nearly twice as slow as on heap caches. But then we moved them off heap as, as, they, as the performance started to improve. Um, the problem with keeping them on heap was we had about, um, f well, nearly 50 gigabytes of data back then, now it's 60, going up even higher very, very soon. And um, at that sort of uh, data sizes or JVM sizes, uh, at the slightest uh, JVM hiccup, uh, garbage collection hiccup can turn into a very, very long pause. So um, uh, we moved as much of it into off heap caches as we could. And that's still in progress. We're gonna move probably everything else uh, into off heap caches. Right now it's a 20 gigabyte JVM heap it's gonna be probably down to about 16 or eight uh, when everything is moved off. Um, yep, so the process for uh, the, this is we load all the data from the databases when the actual cache, uh, the whole service starts up. After that, there's no communication with the databases at all. Everything happens within the uh, Ignite cluster itself. Um, as a search comes in, uh, Jetty, the Jetty layer converts the HTTP request into uh, a, well, a Java object-based request, which will go into uh, a service, a search service that we built, and then the search service will just uh, make queries to the caches and um, form a result. Um, the cache queries, most of them are basically uh, key-based requests. That's the fastest way you could access uh, a, a, an Ignite cache. Um, for some queries where you got range-based criteria, for example, date ranges and whatnot for your stay period, we use the H2 SQL layer um, grid gain have on top of their Apache caches. And that's what uh, provides a whole SQL uh, query layer for them. Um, uh, for that, that basically adds a little bit of uh, latency on top of your query. Also, um, you have to take care of other issues like indexing and um, actual fields you want to extract from, from the caches. You have to declare all of those in Ignite. Uh, that adds a, a bit of data overhead as well, uh, between 30 to 60% per field uh, that you're um, uh, indexing. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Yeah, so that, that system that we built, um, like with 20 nodes, it's handling about 300 million searches a day at the moment, which is basically twice, more than twice the volume that the system we replaced at uh, about 100 nodes, 100 plus nodes. And it's still a growing system, and um, what we found is with a lot of load tests, um, it, it scales linearly. So uh, when we started with 10 nodes, it was pretty much about handling 150 million. With 20 nodes, it's gone up to 300 million without any waste. The only issue we see around with larger nodes is um, uh, st when we start up, uh, we try to do a live blue-green uh, blue um, re uh, replacement of the cluster when we upgrade something. So there's no downtime, but the whole replacement process can take a little bit, lo well, a quite a long time. Um, I'll come to that in a bit. At the bottom we have update nodes. 
uh, before uh, I mentioned that um, once you start the cluster, it doesn't talk to the database anymore. All the searches happens in, in, in place in a given node. Um, so any updates that do happen to the system, for example, when rooms get booked or prices change, um, they have to come into the cluster somehow and that's done via the update node. That subscribes to basically a message bus. The messaging system we're using is RabbitMQ. What happens is that's hooked up to a number of other systems you'll see soon. Um, for example, the booking system, any price update system from third parties, and all of that will come through this uh, one, uh, one route, basically. Okay. This is what the overall architecture looks like. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the actual uh, in-memory grid that I depicted in the previous slide. And on the right-hand side, you have a bunch of uh, systems, including the old iVector system, which is still used for booking, plus a lot of the third-party systems, uh, like the channel managers and the actual um, uh, hotel chains and whatnot, where, which will send us updates for prices and everything. All of that will go into iVector, which will update the database. Then it will generate events. Um, a lot of the work uh, we did on the legacy side was uh, implementing events for SQL operations and the actual .NET layers. Um, then those events will uh, go into the queue and um, in turn update the actual grid. Oh, yeah. So the internals uh, for what we've developed, we've got about 50 odd caches at the moment right now, and as I mentioned, they're fully replicated. Um, and yeah, most are off heap. Um, the queries, um, as, as I mentioned, they're, they're basically direct um, key-based queries. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Da, da, da. I think, yeah, uh, main thing from there, um, in addition to actually having everything fully replicated, even within a given node, we handle a, any given single search uh, in just one thread. Uh, this is uh, because we don't want any thread contention uh, for a single search. Uh, what we found with load test is uh, if you, you can parallelize some of the cache queries. So if you're doing a single search, it, it will make that single search quicker. But when you throw a volume of searches at a node, um, the contention gets in the way after a certain amount. If you restrict everything to a single thread, um, even though that uh, single search request will take maybe uh, 15 milliseconds instead of 10 milliseconds, the overall volume will, will, uh, that you're, you're allowed to search will be much higher in, in terms of 50 to 60%. Um, yeah, and also this, this allows you to scale linearly, not just by um, adding uh, more nodes, but if you could uh, have access to more CPUs for your VMs, um, uh, doing everything in a single th thread for a given search uh, lets you scale linearly by CPU cores as well. So if you have more CPU cores and your memory is fast enough, it, it goes up linearly. Um, uh, uh, deplo the deployments, uh, they're, uh, well, they're on a combination of physical hosts and um, VMs. So we had to test on a number of options. Um, uh, we built a deployment system that lets you deploy in any of those options from physical machines to Azure, AWS, and their actual current environment, which is in a rack space. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's basically a custom development on uh, using Ansible, so it, it's not containerized or anything, but the uh, main reason is it's, it's for actual deployment components, it's just two components that need to be copied on. The main problem comes in, in is in keeping the actual data live, so you could do a deployment of an upgrade without any downtime and with a uh, minimal uh, reduction in service as well. So if you can afford to take uh, two out of the uh, 20 nodes down, 
um, then you could deploy two at a time. If you could afford to take more, or if you could add additional nodes, then you could um, just uh, migrate a number of nodes at a, at a time. Um, yeah, and the, what this also lets us do is scale up the number of nodes you have as traffic grows. So the traffic during the day isn't constant. So using this system, you could turn, turn off nodes when the traffic, there's a lull in the traffic. And, and during some parts of the day when there are a lot of searches or if say some of the clients are um, building caches based on our system, so they'll be just like pummeling us with search requests. During those times you could uh, like spin up a couple of extra nodes. Um, yeah, so a bit of about the successes and challenges that we've faced. Um, basically, we've done some load tests um, to make sure that what we've built is fit for purpose and um, that, that it actually uh, gives the business what they need, which is uh, scalability and some predictability in, in their future upgrade um, like options. So if, if they predict they're gonna have like half a billion searches in two years time, they wanna be able to budget for an IT system for that time. Um, we've, we've done some tests uh, on a number of ones, the ones I'm show, a uh, number of environments. The one I'm showing you here is in AWS, because that's primarily because that's what our development environment is based in. Um, like we've done some tests on M4X large and some of the new R4s as well. Um, that's basically the spec of the CPU. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, the red line is a one second cutoff, which is the SLA for 99% of their searches. So um, we, we look at how far we could scale up uh, and um, uh, before reaching that limit. So we could do 960 requests per second and we still stay within that one second for 99th percentile. Um, the colors there, uh, you got the blue lines showing the actual uh, request rate, the orange lines showing the average, and the darker uh, orange showing the 99th percentile. The average you see stays very, very low um, dur during this whole period. In fact, for like a, you got 20 milliseconds for um, these searches. The actual searches there, they're searching for a combination of entire city searches like London, and um, that's, that makes up for about 30% of the searches, and down to just hotel level searches as well. So the typical uh, search time for London search is, is, is about 100 milliseconds, so you could search entire London for that time, in that time. Um, yeah, so based on that, the gains you've, we've made is a good 90% reduction in the infrastructure they were uh, running. Uh, that saved a lot of costs, uh, as you could imagine. And on top of that, the actual response time is like, uh, again, around 90% as well. Whereas it was a search coming in multiple seconds, now it's in the measure of like tens to hundreds milliseconds. Um, that the main thing that's given the business there is options for expanding what they do at search time rather than um, having to let people search and then come back with further requests based on what they've searched. Um, uh, at, at also, like, less a business run some what-if scenarios as well, uh, which, which wouldn't have been possible with multiple seconds uh, searches. Um, uh, like some of the other so things from the development side is uh, this runs on open source technology. So if you want to build development environments, though, there's no additional cost beyond the actual infrastructure. Whereas with uh, SQL Server in the past, uh, there would have been a cost, well, uh, until SQL Server Developer Edition came out anyway. But even then, if you wanted to run some test environments, if you wanted to give um, so the clients some um, staging environments or something like that, those, as far as Microsoft is concerned, would be considered production systems, so there would, there would be a cost for that. Whereas this, uh, with um, Ignite running on Linux, it's just whatever their infrastructure costs. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, for actual development processes as well, uh, uh, 
moving from stored procedure development into Java-based system, uh, it's allowed us to get new processes in as well, uh, like the test-driven processes. That's, that's, that's helped us uh, migrate the whole um, business implementation, the business rules they have. It's helped us codify that into a set of rules that um, the BAs could understand and define for us, and then you could implement and test against those rules, whereas with stored procedures, that wasn't so easy. Um, uh, also, it, it helps us have some unit tests uh, with a good amount of test coverage, which gives you confidence when you build new features that you haven't broken any previous ones. So if you build a regression test suite on, on top of what, all your new development, any new changes uh, could just put in and you have uh, within minutes, you know whether you've broken anything rather than um, having to wait for things go through a much longer test process and in some cases go into production and then break. Um, it's not all been sweet. There have been some um, pains uh, during the migration. Um, main, re main thing being from the business side that the new system had to produce the exact same results as the old system with the same prices. So we had to replicate um, anything that was in the store procedures exactly in Java code. Uh, and with the uh, database type development where you just create temporary tables for a lot of things, um, if you're working with uh, currency amounts, uh, that number of uh, decimal places you use in those temporary fields all matters. You don't really think about it when you're doing it the database way, but when you're working in code where you're working with big decimals or floats or doubles, you have to know exactly what rounding strategy is being used there and replicate that at every step. Um, and then uh, you, you got the actual development method, the algorithms used in the database as well. A lot of the times they're optimized the way uh, like it's done for databases, or in, in some cases it's not optimized, it's just developed that way because it's easier that way for a database. Whereas uh, in Java code, um, it just might not make sense to follow the exactly same uh, algorithm. So you, you could you had to reconsider the algorithm while actually having the um, output of that being identical. Um, on the actual, um, say, uh, um, yeah, so uh, basically uh, the uh, uh, business side, uh, when they see uh, the actual search times improve, you see the um, changes from the, them as well in what they do. The clients, when they see their searches coming back in milliseconds rather than seconds, they decide to not just search for a given hotel or a given set of rooms, they'll search for entire cities and that changes like your uh, uh, estimation for uh, a few things. It, it changes like, um, uh, 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 like how you design the system to uh, act basically for, for a given load when, when that changes. And as I mentioned before, from the business side itself as well, they decide to include more features as well uh, at search time, um, um, w which again makes that sort of prediction difficult. Um, uh, uh, the other thing from the actual IT side as well, uh, all the monitoring, um, when your old system is based on databases, all the monitoring seems to be based, developed for database systems. So you, you have some systems hooking up to the tables in there, then you have some ETL process that's uh, gonna build some uh, reporting um, on top of that. Um, uh, uh, whereas like with Ignite, there's now out of the box products to do all that for you. And the existing ETL or, or, or existing monitoring systems will not hook up to uh, Ignite as it was to SQL Server. So you, we had to consider a lot of options for that. And we're in the process of building some uh, solutions to that as well. Um, so um, uh, like some of the new systems that we're doing um, 
that, that's uh, uh, basically moving things to Ignite and the uh, lower uh, latency searches that, that we've got has given us is now we could uh, make live third-party searches and include those results as well um, within that cutoff period. Um, so we're building a new system to uh, actually, w when someone searches Jack Travel, they could search uh, multiple third parties and then cache those results. Any subsequent searches, again, Jack Travel could return from the cached result set. So we're building a new system uh, for that. And um, that, that, that also reduces the number of searches they have to do to third parties as well, because there's a cost associated to that. For example, if you're gonna search Expedia a billion times and then not make any bookings against them, there'll be an expense. Um, things like that get reduced, which is a plus. Um, and then what you could also do is smarter searches. You could have some analytics in place um, uh, that, that uh, see what kind of searches you're getting and the third party searches you do, you could restrict that only to the common types rather than some, some random search for a location that no one searched for a year. Um, and then on top of that, you got other uh, real-time statistics as well. You could see which clients are searching what locations. If there's a spike uh, all of a sudden in searches for a given location, and then you, you can react to that information if you need to. Um, uh, well, like in addition to this real-time uh, analytics, we're also uh, uh, like integrating with um, some further down the line analytics like some, uh, well, mostly it's Grafana based right now, but I think there are considerations to look into uh, the Elastic Stack. Um, um, yeah, as I've mentioned, the JVM um, size has been a problem. Uh, so, um, uh, like uh, on the downsides, we'd ha we've had to do a lot of work around how we write our code uh, for these searches. For example, we've switched everything to streams where we can, and that way uh, all, the gar all, all the objects are short-lived. Um, they don't hang around too much. The garbage collector doesn't want to uh, mess around with them too much. Um, there are one or two times where uh, we've got bitten in that. Say if, uh, if the objects like hang around for too much, you end up in a long course, basically, even with the new G, G1 garbage collector. So um, at, at a 20 gigabyte heap, you have to look out for things like that. Um, yep, and uh, like rebalancing is an issue as well. For example, uh, with 60 gigabytes of data, uh, when you start um, uh, reading the database uh, at, for, for your new cluster, that will take its time but then they will take a good 10 odd minutes to uh, migrate out to other nodes that you, you're starting at the same time as well. So you have to account for that when you're restarting. Um, and um, there, are, there were a few issues around Ignite as well. I mean, it's a product that's got a lot of uh, development going on. There are new features being added to that. Uh, you have to watch out for when you start using those features. Um, uh, you could say if you run into any issues like that. Um, uh, grid gain, they're, they're very helpful in that respect, but there will be times where uh, you, you have to wait a bit too long. Um, it, it won't be suitable for your use. For example, the um, native persistence right now has been uh, a developing uh, process. I mean, um, before 2, uh, Ignite 2, it was a different native persistence mechanism. So when changes like that, you have to watch out for. If you designed your system for the old one, then when, when they switched it, you have to change your development around that as well. Um, um, uh, advantages has been, though, uh, the developers you hire, they could be more business focused. Whereas, uh, whereas in, in previous roles where I've worked with a lot of in-house development, the people you hired, they, they would need to know about um, how the data is being stored, how it's being handled in what sort of memory, uh, well, data structures, and how they're moving about, how they are uh, being moved about between machines as well, the whole clustering aspects, and probably recovery mechanisms. Um, Ignite takes care of 
all of that for you, so you don't have to worry about that, and your developers can, while it, it's useful to know that, they don't have to be experts in that field, which really helps. Um, so that's basically uh, a gist of uh, what we've been developing. Um, there are other couple of projects that where we've um, uh, used this system as well um, in, in sort of some flight searches where we're doing connection building uh, for um, uh, flight connections. Um, we built some POCs around that um, and, and in other uh, hotel uh, and, and holiday booking systems as well. So it's, it's basically a, uh, a, well, a heavy development um, uh, time for this, I guess. So um, that's it from me. If you have any questions, 